What is the mission of the Basser Center, the true goal of the Basser Center? The goal of the Basser Center is that individuals who have these gene mutations don't have to worry about cancer, that we can use basic science to advance the clinical care and intercept cancers without having to do surgical prevention. A lot of people like myself who've watched the Basser Center become what it is today, we've all gone through these surgeries and we've gone through all of these processes and now we have kids that are coming of age that we're worried about mm -hmm. and it feels so pressing to all of us. Yes. Would you say it's as equally as pressing to you as a scientist? Yes, I mean, I think that the, the concern we always have in medicine is that nothing moves fast enough. That, that's on our end too. We do feel this pressure um, in a good way. We, we know that the impact of these things have on, on families and on people, and we want to do better. So we want to move forward as quickly as we can and as rigorous as, uh, rigorously as we can because the therapies that we come up with and the prevention strategies that we come up with have to help you, not harm you, and have to be effective. When you look at cases like mine, I assume you haven't seen that many of them, right? I mean, they're rare. Right, I, you know, th this is the, the, the hard, hard thing um, about cancer is that we give numbers, but they mean nothing if you're the one that it happens to. And, and we're, we're well aware of that. You know, we know that if an individual has a bilateral mastectomy, that the chances of developing a new breast cancer in residual breast tissue are supposed to be one to two percent. Um, but we are really interested in figuring out who might be at higher risk to have that happen. Um, I think that it is very difficult um, to know exactly how much breast tissue is removed, for example. Um, a really good mastectomy re removes a maximal amount of breast tissue and leaves a very little bit behind. But it only takes a little bit being left behind to develop into a cancer. And so I think that's where we have work to do as more women are living much longer after their mastectomies. We need to know that that number is right and we need to know if there's anything we can do to decrease that risk even further. Women who are having bilateral mastectomy, one of the main advantages to doing it is that we, they don't need regular MRIs. They don't need regular monitoring. There has been you know, some talk about whether or not women who have mastectomies, you know, should they get an MRI to go looking uh, for breast tissue? I think that there we don't have really good data on what we're looking for. So it's gonna be really important to, to kind of create the, 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 the rubric, to create the metrics so that we know what we're looking for and what we're going to do with that information. But I do think that there may be a time where um, it may be a little bit more routine to look postoperatively at residual breast tissue. But again, we just need more data on what we're looking for. What we don't wanna do is do these images and not understand the results and create more problems for patients because we've you know, seeing things that we don't understand. So I think this has really generated a lot of interest for people to go back and we've got, we have lots of images, we have lots of patients to go back and look harder at this. Many times the, the tumors that occur in residual breast tissue sort of are along the skin and so we can feel them more easily, um, particularly, you know, if an implant is placed under the muscle, then the recurrence is kind of along the skin and we can feel it. We know that triple negative breast cancer is much more common in individuals who have BRCA1 uh, mutations. So to give you some numbers around that, um, for BRCA1, it's you know 75% uh, of the cases are triple negative. In the general population, that rate is more like 15 to 20%. So it's really a stark difference. And so we do have an active trial for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, um, and we treated a cohort of people with prior cancer, and now we are treating individuals who have never had cancer but have BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So this is a big step. These are healthy people coming in to receive an experimental vaccine. And it really gets to something that you mentioned before, the importance of this to individuals, but also for their families. So these are individuals who are generally coming in because they're worried about their children. And they're saying, I know this is experimental, but I'll roll up my sleeve and get this because if this can advance things so that my kids can get this vaccine, I will absolutely do it. And that's really humbling and actually quite emotional for me that people will do this. Uh, so we have uh, vaccinated now you know, 11 healthy carriers and we're uh, making our way through this and making sure that it's safe and it generates an immune response and then we can go from there. Do you think a vaccine for the public is 
10 years down the road, 20 years down the road? Yeah, I think that the, the, the challenge gets to be how you prove a vaccine works. And um, you know, the first steps are to make sure that it's safe and generates an immune response. In order to prove that it works, in general, you have to do a randomized trial of many patients, and that trial has to last for sort of at least five years. So, you know, so I, I you know, I, 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 I will, although I would hope 10, I think realistically more like 15 if everything goes well, but still we're, we're actually administering these drugs to patients now. So, in the trials. In trials. So this is, you know, this is in, in clinical trials, it is proceeding apace and we all want it to go faster, but at the same time, we have to make sure it's safe as well. Science really has been changing rapidly. We've got a lot of more tools in our toolbox, so I'm an optimist.